Hey guys, it's David here, and Netflix has this new show, Glow, which they launched at the end of June. If you haven't watched it, you've probably seen it on your Facebook timeline or your Twitter newsfeed. Strike that. Reverse it. It is the origin story of an actual uh, women's wrestling program, Glow, the Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling, set in 1985. It is executive produced by Genji Cohen and created by Liz Flahive and Carly Mensch. I am sorry if I mispronounced any of these names. If you haven't watched the show, this review, critique, analysis may have some spoilers. I'm not going to try and focus too heavily on the plot, but if you're somebody who is very anti-spoiler, then go watch the show, bookmark this video, put it in your watch later list or whatever, and then come back and see if you agree or disagree with my thoughts. So first off, this show was positioned to be, in a large part, empowering for women. It's a full female ensemble, and uh, it was meant to poke fun at the blatant misogyny of the 19th 80s. I'll read a little quote from the show's creator, Liz Flahive, Flahive, these pronunciations, you know. We wanted to look back on the 70s, coming out of the women's movement and into the 80s, and ask the question, did it work? Did things get better? We were pitching the show pre-Trump, and we went into the pitch saying things like, this is a great time for women. We're about to elect our first female president. So a sort of double looking back is something that's really present in the show. It is undebatably a step forward to have yet another series that has an all-female cast, that has a creative team led by women. One of the show's stars, actually, Betty Gilpin, uh, wrote a really great piece for Glamour. I definitely suggest it. And she talked about how she had never been on a set full of so many women and how empowering it was to be a part of that creative team. However, I don't think that the show necessarily lives up to that feminist label in its actual content and the story that it's telling. The show was widely reviewed very well, and so many of these articles pointed out that the show was in some way allowing these women to possess and own their sexuality. And there was one specific review from Variety I disagreed with so many points it made. Uh, one thing that it said was that it eschews building up its women as sexualized totems in order to observe how those women might pursue that process themselves, which, if you've seen the show, I think is total BS. This whole notion that by wrestling with each other in tiny little leotards that these women feel empowered and like they own their bodies never really gets fully developed beyond like, we're participating in a sport together and therefore it's feminism because women doing things. Also, the show overall doesn't necessarily flesh out all of its female characters in the ensemble, which I think is a gross oversight. Britannica played by Kate Nash, who that was a, I got a kick out of seeing her on screen, don't get me wrong. And I think she did a great job, but her character is basically just there to be made fun of. And the fact that they are roping not only fictional cat fights into the ring, but also real life disputes, which is put on display the very first moment in the pilot uh, when the two main characters have a real life fight over infidelity. <laughs> is this real? Who the fuck cares? Feminism is definitely two women pulling at each other's hair because of a man. Yeah. <laughs> Calling. So yes, we've established that this show is uh, in some ways encouraging the exact misogyny it claims to be combating. But we haven't even talked about racism and racial stereotypes as they're present in the show. The producer, Bash, assigns the women simplistic roles so that the audience won't get confused. Jenny becomes fortune cookie. Tammy becomes the welfare queen. Arthi becomes Beirut to name a few. I will say that this is definitely true to the source material. The director of The Real Glow in the 80s, Matt Simber, was a huge fan of negative reinforcement, sort of bullying the girls into stepping up tensions on stage. He was the one who came up with all the characters and uh, the women, some of whom did an interview with the Washington Post recently, recalled these stereotypes as being empowering and that they didn't feel that they were exploited, but that once they had accepted this persona, that they felt almost like superheroes. I will argue argue that had they lived in a time where we're now seeing Wonder Woman the movie come out and blow a bunch of records out of the water, feeling empowered by something like that would feel largely dated. These stereotypes were simply a product of that time and their limited opportunities, and maybe they would have felt less like superheroes. Back to this Variety review, which refers to the roles as campy, which I never realized that campy was a synonym to racist. Usually the characters themselves aren't sure if they're reinforcing prejudice or interrogating it, but they're still fired up, and why not? Whatever they're doing in the ring, they're active, not passive. They're taking on a persona instead of waiting for one to be grafted onto them, which is literally not what happens in the show. 
the identities are grafted onto them by the two men who are running the show. <laughs> These are the kinds of things that I read and I'm like, are you paying attention? It's good that I brought up the Beirut character because at least the Guardian acknowledged that there's a moment uh, in their live taping of the show where her character arouses essentially like racist white power energy from the audience and sh her character looks shocked and concerned. I felt like, okay, maybe now the show is going to dig into the price that these women are paying for this. But no, it just kind of like leaves it as a loose end, doesn't deal with it in any way, and ultimately presents the show as kind of confused about whether it is actually trying to highlight these racial stereotypes as something that is bad or trying to show them as something that is like empowering and good. It doesn't really have a clear statement to make. A lot of publications resolved that the show's shorter running time was the reason for them not digging deeper. The Washington Post just said it was trying to like keep a brisk pace. I rather liked Richard Lawson's piece in Vanity Fair about how the show succumbed to its baser comedic impulses, either not having enough time or not having the best time management to dig into the deeper analysis that was promised by the earlier parts of the series. And so instead of focusing on more complex efforts, the writers rely on the irony of the Sam Sylvia character, the director, in order to let the audience know that it's okay. This character is just a well of contradictions. I mean, there's a scene where he goes to this upper class, you know, rich people party and is saying, oh, you know, screw them, they're conservatives, they're fighting the drug war while they get loaded on Kier Royales and then immediately proceeds to go to the uh, musicians, the only black people in the room, and asks them if they have any coke on them. So it's just like, okay, great. I don't know what to make of you. In a conversation with one of the show's most problematic caricatures, the welfare queen, Sam says that it's sort of a fuck you to the Republican Party and their welfare reform and race baiting shit. While I appreciate that they're at least acknowledging it with this one-on-one -on -one scene, it almost shows that they know what they're leaving out and are just not really doing the actual real work to resolve the issue. I will note that the actress who plays Tammy, Kia Stevens, is an actual wrestling star, the only one in the cast. The whole name issue was something that she experienced in her own life. I'm not sure if she asked to have this scene or if they were inspired by her story, but in 2002, when she started wrestling in Japan, they dubbed her Amazing Kong, and she had issues with it initially because of the obvious racial parallels. In Japan, there was already a wrestler named Aja Kong, and and the term Kong, it d denotes strength more than any racial slur. So it wasn't necessarily like the directors of that show were aware of the choice they were making. Whereas in this fictional Glow story, the director knows exactly what name he's putting onto this actress. Now, despite all of these issues that I have with the show's more serious representation issues, I still enjoyed the comedy aspect. I thought that it was very entertaining and funny. The main issues that I had with the show was that it kept reminding me it was trying to do something bigger than just make me laugh. The Guardian stated this perfectly well. If it had only allowed you to turn off the bits of your brain that notice horrendous flaws, perhaps Glow could have been more open about what it truly is. A problematic riot, but one that by no means is here to change anything. Ultimately, the most unique theme of this show is actually not embracing racial stereotypes or embracing misogyny, but embracing not being liked. The main character is chosen as Ruth. This choice of starring the heel, so to speak, is a much more universally empowering choice. And so why not focus and just dig into this theme and make the show an all around outrageous comedy rather than trying to kind of have your cake and eat it too and talk about all of these societal issues. But if you're gonna have a simpler show, you probably should take on another name. They take on Glow, the gorgeous ladies of wrestling, but they didn't consult any of the original cast, creative team, or anybody really other than the rights holder. The show's creators claimed that they distanced themselves from the source material in order to have more flexibility creating their own characters for the fictional show. But uh, anybody who's seen the documentary on Netflix from 2012 about the original Glow show can see that they must have at least given that a watch because almost all of these fictional characters are immediately recognizable 
while watching that documentary. If they did want to actually base their show on the real life glow, why not lean on the other end of things? Maybe a more gritty, more dramatic side where they can show the hardships of being on this team that were actually experienced by these women. The Washington Post published a great article with some of the original cast members of the Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. They talk about all of the injuries that occurred, getting cut in the eye with glitter weaponized by hairspray. There was one deleted scene that uh, Alison Brie, the actress who plays Ruth, talked about with The Hollywood Reporter. Mark's character commented on bruises that she had on her leg. And this shows the creators were at least thinking about acknowledging the physical intensity of wrestling. But what we ended up with was this kind of squeaky clean show where they don't acknowledge how physically intensive this entire experience was for these women. There was one super dramatic instance that the original Glow ladies talked about, and this is going to come with like a trigger warning. I'm, it's a self-harm thing. Um, but the, the actress, instead of leaving the show because I think that they had fired her, she literally slit her wrists and smeared the blood all over the walls of the backstage while they were dragging her out because she wanted to stay on the show that badly. And if this is the kind of drama that's happening for the real life experience back in the 80s, I just wonder why they shied away from those grittier elements so much for this show. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking if you dig into these more negative, dramatic, shocking elements, the comedy of the show will be lost, and that is truly its strongest element. And so lastly, I pitch this idea, which I think could really work. Keep the lighter, more comedic, fantastical nature of the origin story. However, kind of similar to how Orange is the New Black flashes to backstories, which I know that in interviews the creator said they wanted to get away from that, they wanted to focus on where the characters are going in the future, they should do flashes forward to where the actresses are after the show was canceled. In 1990, the original show was canceled very abruptly at the peak of its success, and now this interview with Washington Post finds the actresses in all different kinds of walks of life. Some of these girls became drug addicts, some of them became homeless, uh, some of them turned to porn. These stories are really where they can add some of that drama and the lens through which to view this origin story in a more analytical way. Of the like over 100 girls that went through the original Glow show, only four ended up being wrestlers. So what happened to the rest of them? And these aren't all sob stories. Some of them became very successful. Angela Altishin, who played Little Egypt, which was one of the show's more recognizable characters, became like super successful in real estate and retired at the age of 45 and has five houses paid off. In the documentary itself, she organizes this reunion and all the girls get to see each other after like 20 some years. So there are opportunities for the characters to interact in these future scenes and uh, create dynamic storylines in that way. This would obviously require probably like a longer running time of at least 45 minutes. Would it be a bad thing for views? I'm not sure. Maybe people don't want to watch a full 45 minute episode, but right now living somewhere in the middle is just not leaving me entirely satisfied one way or the other. But those are just my thoughts, my opinions. I would like to know what you guys thought of this show, if you watched it or if you plan to watch it, and uh, whether you agreed with me or disagreed. I will link all of the sources in the description below. While you're down there, you can also check out my Patreon. I've just launched a Patreon page, and uh, I thank all of you guys who have become supporters on there. You'll see your name in the credits after I say goodbye. If you like this video and you want to support me creating new content, then definitely check out that page. I have all kinds of perks, and I would love to see you over there. Lastly, make sure you hit the subscribe button, and uh, then you'll be notified every time I make a new video. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. And uh, other than that, I thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you very soon. All right. Bye. There's my heart. Oh, oh, there's my heart. Oh, oh. Now everybody seems to be just fine. So go in a line. But I just want somebody to call mine. A bit romantic with candles on the side. And you giggle heavily, breathe down your spine. Now I've gone through the chapters, the pages, and the scenes. But nobody ever completed this thing.